Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question the narrative video and today's topic is the AI history template strikes again. As most of you who have been here before know, I am pretty certain that much of our history has been either rewritten or fabricated. And I've talked about it in several videos, specifically this one about three months ago. It's called Wake Up, We Are Not the First. And I mentioned how I believe that Wikipedia and other history sources, and in fact, it would have to be other history sources that were written before Wikipedia, they all seem to follow a sort of template when presenting history. They will often use the same types of names or different variations of names. Very often, if it's buildings, there will be some sort of fires or reconstruction, or we'll find out that they were built on like marshlands or swamplands. There's, it just always seems to be a lot of repetitiveness in the stories that we are told, no matter who we look up in history or what building we seem to look up in history. I also spoke about it in this video called World's Fairs Post at post-reset re-education. And in that one, I specifically talked about someone named Hubert Howe Bancroft, who pretty much single-handedly wrote American history. So I'll leave links to both of these videos in, in the description box. And I, I also have to add that I do know that um, my lunch break recently also put out a video on AI and how it seems to be writing history for us. And I know that he's mentioned that before, that he, he believes that AI has been around for much longer than it has been. And it certainly does seem to be the case, especially when you see the repetitiveness of these, of these histories, the, or I should say historical narratives that we are being um, fed, so to speak. So I do agree with that. And at first, when, when I talked about these things, I, I assumed that maybe someone was just writing them or they would hire a huge staff of people who were given some sort of template to write these histories. But AI certainly seems to be a possibility, especially in this day and age. So the reason that I'm showing you the Brothers Grimm is because I got the idea for this video from the book, The Mythology of Grimm, The Fairy Tale and Folklore Roots of the Popular TV Show. And I'm just reading it kind of for fun and because you all know that I, I like that sort of thing. And as I was reading the biography of the Brothers Grimm in the book, I noticed right away that they fit right in with that history template that we see throughout all of these stories that were given. So I'm over here now on Wikipedia and I'm just going to show you first of all what really got my attention and made me want to look further into this. So as I was reading I found out that the mother of Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm, her name was Dorothy. Now over here on this article, because I didn't see this specifically in the Wikipedia one, this is also a biography of Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm, and it's from GermanyInsiderFacts.com. And it's the same information that I read in the book. So their mother's name was Dorothy. And then when their father passed away, they were sent to live with their aunt, Henrietta. So we have the mother's name is Dorothy, the aunt's name is Henrietta, and what do you know? Wilhelm marries someone named Henrietta Dorothy. And right away, I thought to myself, whoa, I think this is something that I want to look into and see if there are any more of these repetitive names in their history. And Yes, there are. And I'm going to share some of them with you. And the interesting thing is, and this is the same thing that happens in the other histories as well. Sometimes it's variations of the same name over and over and over again. So I just want to give you an example of how this works. So let's just read what Wikipedia has to say. Jakob Ludwig Karl Grimm and Wilhelm Karl Grimm were born on the 4th of January, 1785, and the 24th of February, 1786, respectively, in Hanau, in the Landgraviate of Hesse Castle within the Holy Roman Empire, to Philip Wilhelm Grimm, a jurist, 
and Dorothy Grimm, nay Zimmer, daughter of a Castle City councilman. In 1796, Philip Grimm died of pneumonia, causing great poverty for the large family. Dorothy was forced to relinquish the brother's servants and large house, depending on financial support from her father and sister, who was then the first lady-in-waiting at the court of William I, Elector of Hesse. So already we have a William here, and then we have their father, or not their father, but Wilhelm Grimm. So we've got Wilhelm, we've got William. And you might think, okay, well, well, that's nothing. Well, just wait, because it, it continues. Inspired by their law professor, Friedrich von Savigny, who awakened in them an interest in history and philology, the brothers studied medieval German literature. They shared Savigny's desire to see the unification of the 200 German principalities into a single state. Through Savigny and his circle of friends, German romantics such as Clemens Brentano and Ludwig Achim von Amim, the Grimms were introduced to the ideas of Johann Gottfried Herder, who thought that German literature should revert to simpler forms. I'm going to stop right there because there's a reason that I'm reading specific sections to you because these are the sections that we are going to start noticing patterns. So I just want you to remember now the names Friedrich and the names Ludwig. In 1840, Savigny and Bettina von, oh, it's Arnim, I, I said that wrong before, appealed successfully to Frederick William the Fourth of Prussia. So now we've got a Wilhelm, a William, now we've got another William here, and we have a Frederick on top of the Friedrich that we just saw. Jacob found full-time employment in 1808 when he was appointed court librarian to the King of Westphalia and went on to become a librarian in Castle. After their mother's death that year, he became fully responsible for his younger siblings. He arranged and paid for his brother Ludwig's stories at art school and for Wilhelm's extended visit to Halle to seek treatment for heart and respiratory ailments. So again, we've got Ludwig up here, we've got Ludwig down here. And, you know, you're probably thinking, well, this this could happen in, in real life. And it, it certainly could. But this is something that you do see over and over and over and over in the histories that we are given. So I'm just going to scroll down here because they mentioned someone named Charles Perrault. Okay, so it says they collected and published their tales as a reflection of German cultural identity. In the first collection, though, they included Charles Perrault's tales, published in Paris in 1697. So Charles Perrault is also mentioned in the Brothers Grimm book. It just gives a short biography of him, too, because they kind of look at him as a precursor to the Brothers Grimm. So let's see what Wikipedia has to say about Charles Perrault and see if we see any of this repetition that we do in the Brothers Grimm history. Perrault was born in Paris on the 12th of January, 1628, to a wealthy bourgeois family and was the seventh child of Pierre Perrault and Paquette Leclerc. He attended very good schools and studied law before embarking on a career in government service, following in the footsteps of his father and elder brother, Jean. So first of all, I want to point out to you that he studied law, just as the brothers Grimm did. And this is something else that you will find is that many times um, people who did similar things in history will also seem to have a similar back history. Uh, one of the other things that they have in common that I'm not going to really get into this time is that they both have links to royal libraries, to having either um, an employer who, who is linked to the, the court library or they themselves were in the court libraries. So again, it's just something that you see a, a lot. Now here we notice that his elder brother's name is Jean. So let's just start there. He took part in the creation of the Academy of Sciences, as well as the restoration of the Academy of Painting. In 1654, he moved in with his brother Pierre, who had purchased the position of chief tax collector of the city of Paris. 
when the academy of inscriptions and bell letters i don't speak french so i will not be pronouncing this correctly was founded in 1663 perrault was appointed its secretary and served under jean baptiste colbert finance minister to king louis the 14th let's also ke keep louis in mind okay louis louis however you want to say it so we have jean the brother we have jean baptiste colbert now we have jean chapelain so yeah i'm terrible at french i took it in sixth grade and just that was the only language i didn't like <laughs> anyway just because i wasn't very good at it so we have three jeans so far okay now, to save time, I'm kind of skipping around a little bit to, to try to keep group think names together. Um, I'll leave links in the descriptions, of course, if you want to read these, you know, in full. But I, this is just to show you the repetition. Because now we have two Jeans already. Again, we have Jean and then we have Jean-Baptiste Colbert. And down here we have Philippe Quinault, a longtime family friend of the Perrault's, quickly gained a reputation as the librettist for the new musical genre known as opera, collaborating with composer Jean-Baptiste Lully. So now we do not only have a third Jean, now we have a second Jean-Baptiste, but this time it's Jean-Baptiste Lully. So now let's move on to the name Louis that I mentioned before. And we have here using his influence as Colbert's administrative aide in April, 1667, he was able to get his brother Claude Perrault appointed to a committee of three, the petite consul, also including Louis Laval and Charles Lebrun. So now we have two Louis. So down here we have in 1668, Perrault wrote painting to honor the king's first painter, Charles Lebrun. He also wrote courses de tets, I'm not even going to finish, head and ring races, written to commemorate the 1662 celebrations staged by Louis for his mistress, Louise. Not only Louise, though, it's Louis, Louise Francois. And now it's time to look at Francois. So will we find any other variation of the name Francois like we saw with Louise Francois? Well, yes, we, we will. The design was chosen over designs by John Lorenzo Bernini and Francois Mansart. So we have a Francois in the feminine form and then we have Francois in the masculine form. But that is not all, because down here we find out that Colbert's bitter rival succeeded him, Francois Michel. And so now we have a third variation of the name Francois. So again, this is something that could be completely coincidental. But if you actually take the time to just kind of type in people's names, historical figures that you know, type them in. And go, it's easiest on Wikipedia, but you could probably go in just in the encyclopedias anywhere. And you will see that if you look up people who are very similar to each other, first of all, you might find that they have similar backgrounds. Or just in general, you will find that many of the names, and sometimes it's not even people's names, sometimes it could be the name of a church that, that is repeated along with a person's name, you know, like there might be St. Mary and you might find lots of Marys and Marias and Marians in, in the historical narrative that you're given. It could be the name of an organization. Many times you'll see when it comes to buildings, the, the architectures, uh, the architectural stories always include names like Johnson and Son, Fredericks and Son, and you'll see and Son and Son and Son over and over again. So really, this was just a, a fun video that I wanted to share with you, really, because I was, <laughs> I was, I don't want to say surprised, but I was amused, we'll say, when I came across the fact that the Brothers Grimm, their mother's name was Dorothy, their aunt who took care of them was Henrietta, and then what do you know, Wilhelm named, or marries a woman named Dorothy Henrietta. It's just like, what are the odds? But 
that's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one down below. And if you like my work and would like to support my channel, I will leave a link in the description box for my channel membership, or you can just click on it right on my channel page. And I hope you have a great day.